This video is sponsored by Fubo TV. There is little worse than dealing with the ridiculous prices of cable. Millions have cut the cord and many more might be on the way. But what about the sports? Don't you need cable for that? Not exactly. With Fubo TV, a rich arsenal of sports channels are at your disposal for about half the price. We're talking all four major sports league channels, regional networks, the mainstays, international channels, NFL Red Zone for football season. Certain events are even viewable in 4K. You can record any game you like and you can watch on any device with the Fubo TV app. It's come in handy for me when I'm out of the house. My cell phone with Fubo TV has saved me from the horrors of no sports more than I'd like to admit. And best of all, it's easy to try. It only takes two minutes to sign up and you can get started. If you don't like it, you can cancel at any time. It's worth giving a shot to. You can even get 15% off your first month by going to fubotv.com slash utree. I like sports, but I hate spending a lot of money to watch them. That's why I feel that Fubo TV works for me. Now on to the main attraction. So it's come down to this. The Arizona Coyotes, a longtime staple of futility in the NHL landscape, are being forced out of Glendale. After the 2021-22 season, they are being kicked out for a multitude of reasons. It felt like this was inevitable. Too many years where things were on the edge, too much financial bleeding for both the team and Glendale itself. If they stay in the Phoenix area isn't known, as there's a chance they could move to Tempe, but leaving the city is a very real possibility. To watch a team move, even for a hardcore fan base as small as the Coyotes, is tough. But it's an inevitability in North American sports. They want to make money. If something isn't lining up, they either force their way out or move by necessity. Before the situation, the last team to move in the NHL were the revival of the Winnipeg Jets. Home to one of the smallest arenas in hockey, yet one of the most passionate fan bases in the game. Even then, comparable to how Winnipeg lost a team to Phoenix, the city took a team from another area. That team was the Atlanta Thrashers. I never really gave them much thought when I was younger. They were either too poor to take seriously or too mediocre to be considered as a legitimate threat. I always considered it as a foolish attempt by the NHL to try to expand south, but in hindsight, that doesn't seem like the right take. I think we need to re-examine this whole situation. Was Atlanta really at fault for not supporting the Thrashers? Or were there other elements at play? To consider things fully look to the past. The Thrashers weren't the first foray by the NHL into the city. Back in the 1970s, the Flames were originally an Atlanta franchise. The decade of disco wasn't all bad for the group. They were okay. They weren't an open eyesore in the league like a few other franchises, but they were far from the elite. They had consistently made the playoffs, but experienced little success in them. Want to take a wild guess as to their record in the playoffs? They went 2-15 in them during their time in Atlanta. The team itself did nothing wrong. They did what they could to succeed, but there was bad luck aplenty. The local economy went to shit. Ownership was bleeding money and on the brink of financial collapse. Fans slowly tuned out and walked away either due to apathy or lack of spending capital. Why support a team that's just going to bow out of the playoffs in two or three games? The average fan doesn't want to spend money on mediocrity. By 1980, nothing they did worked. Atlanta had become captivated by other teams. So just like General Sherman, the Flames torched the city for $16 million. They were moving to Calgary. Whatever fan base was left could only bitterly watch as the team would eventually have the playoff success that could have captivated the locals. Imagine if that 1981 run happened earlier. Perhaps the Flames would have stayed in Atlanta longer. Possibly permanently. But it wasn't meant to be. Hockey would get another chance here, however. The year was 1999. The NHL, eager to expand their product into untapped markets, decided to give Atlanta another chance. But even this early, I start to realize something. The chance the league gave to the city was hollow. If you were to consider the expansion draft that Atlanta had to choose from, it was pretty bad. The year before, Nashville got the main pickings. And even they had been slim. The NHL itself didn't help matters. Any team that had lost a goalie in the expansion draft to Nashville was exempt from offering one to Atlanta. So there goes five teams goalies out the bat. The other pickings were pretty slim. Prospects with limited upside, past prime veterans, or impending free agents. The only real player I can see who was young and could have long-term impact is Sergei Breland. And New Jersey wanted to protect him. They offered Atlanta Sergei Vyshenkovich instead, who did a whole lot of nothing for the Thrashers. There was also Igor Larionov available, but would he have stayed in Atlanta? Not that it mattered, Detroit traded off Samuelson's expiring contract to keep him in tow. Don Waddell was the GM here. His opening round was rough, but his true test was coming up. 
1999 was an incredibly weak year for the NHL draft, but he held the number one pick after a trade with Vancouver. The team's first ever selection? Patrick Stefan. He did not pan out. Unless you want to count the meme world on a different team, then maybe you can argue he was elite. The same could not be said for the Thrashers in their first few years. Besides Ray Ferraro's reemergence, there was little to be excited for. They lost. And lost. And lost more than that. It allowed them to pick up some nice talent in the draft like Ilya Kovalchuk, Danny Heatley, and Kari Lettinen, but there wasn't much else coming. The Thrashers had a deadly sin. They couldn't draft outside the first round. And sometimes they couldn't even draft properly in the first round. If you were to name the non-first round players who had played over 100 games for the team in their drafts, you could count them on one hand until 2009. Garnet Exelby, Passy Nermanen, Toby Enstrom, Andre Pavlek, Paul Postma, and Ben Sherratt. That's throughout their entire history in Atlanta. That is fucking terrible. The only impact players here were Enstrom and maybe Pop. All that the Thrashers had was a black eye. On September 29, 2003, Danny Heatley and Dan Snyder were involved in a car crash. Heatley had been driving recklessly down suburban Atlanta and the car struck a wall splitting in half. At least for Heatley, he only suffered injuries taking him out for most of the season. Dan Snyder wasn't as lucky. He suffered septic shock and died five days later. The young franchise now had a dark chapter to deal with, and the city and thrashers rallied around Heatley. But even for all of the love and support, Danny didn't want to be reminded of the tragedy and requested a trade. In a sharp blow, he got shipped to Ottawa for Marion Hossa and Greg DeVry. Hossa was great, but not the same as a homegrown player like Heatley. The trauma of that day lingered on, and it may have affected fans as well. Amplifying factors was one related to the low payrolls and piss poor drafting. They didn't win. They had upside in the mid 2000s, but they could never capitalize on it due to elements in and out of their control. Unlike their previous iteration, the Thrashers only made the playoffs once in 2007. They were swept. It's not like they didn't try. Don Waddell brought in veterans to get the team going. Bobby Holik, Slava Kozlov, Keith Kachuk, Alexei Zhitnik, who they traded Braden Coburn for. The idea was right, but without true support, the team itself was hollow. Atlanta brings in all these veterans, but let's go of Mark Savard after a breakout season? They had high-end skill, but little depth. So they would usually miss the postseason. Even if it was only by two points, like in 2006. They were mediocre. The worst place to be for a team. If only that was the worst outcome. We need to rewind a few years back to 2003. The Thrasher's original owner and Time Warner was going through chaotic issues of their own. They needed to cut assets due to their disastrous merger with AOL. So there go the Thrashers and Hawks onto the market. You know where this is going. Hell itself was about to enter the picture for the team. A nightmare ownership group that put more effort into fighting each other than they did support the city. Atlanta Spirit. A collective of businessmen from Atlanta, DC, and Boston who banded together to buy the Thrashers and Hawks. All you have to do is mention this name to anyone in Atlanta. There will be choice words used. Right after that 2007 season, Atlanta spirit was remarkably chaotic. They were more interested in suing a partner in Scott Belkin than they were in overseeing the Thrashers and Hawks. Somehow they cared even less for their hockey team than anything else. And the only thing the relentless flinging of lawsuits did was wreck their financial strength. Don Waddell had no one to answer to but one directive. Reduce payroll. The Thrashers allegedly lost 20 million in 2007 and struggling in 2008 gave them the impetus to trade their stars in incredibly lopsided deals. Marion Hossa was a free agent after the season, so it was a good excuse to send him to Pittsburgh for a package that included next to nothing. But Dell was even so kind as to throw in Pascal Dupuis so he could reemerge as a quality winger. Oya Kovalchuk's demands were too rich for the team, and the result was him being exiled to New Jersey for almost nothing. Kari Lettinen moved for roughly nothing. Most of the veteran acquisitions were let go in free agency for nothing. Yet their apparent answer to all of this was grossly overpaying Ron Hainsey. It set the team back years. And it's all thanks to the worthless folks at Atlanta Spirit for not investing in scouting and development. Here's my question though. If the Thrashers had lost $130 million since you bought the team, then why the hell did the Hawks sign Joe Johnson to that exorbitant contract? You knew Johnson wasn't worth anywhere close to that, yet Atlanta Spirit approved it anyway? Why should Atlanta support the Thrashers when ownership doesn't give a fuck? So people would slowly walk away from the team echoing the 70s. It wasn't like they were missing much, the team was pretty shit by this point. 
So as a result of dwindling attendance, the Thrashers were forced to resort to gimmicky marketing tactics that were desperate at best and tone deaf at worst. 48-year-old Chris Chelios. The mascot getting arrested in a low-speed chase in a Zamboni. Marketing the black players to appeal to the urban crowd. Even the GM is holding up signs begging them to come to games. Players changed, coaches changed, Rick Dudley became GM as Don Waddell ascended to presidency. None of it worked. And by that point, the writing was on the wall. Ownership would be taking solicitors to sell the team. And there weren't many people from Atlanta willing to keep the experiment going. Not to pay rent for Phillips Arena. The NHL had a choice to make. Keep Atlanta or keep Phoenix. Glendale threw $25 million to keep the team around, so they stayed. So the league was giving them no aid. A group from Winnipeg came in with an offer of $170 million and it was over. The city had lost another hockey team. Considering the past two forays, the NHL probably won't be heading back here for a long time. If at all. So what can we learn from the Thrashers and their failure to thrive? To me, it's about the importance of quality ownership. Atlanta's spirit was absolute shit. Their infighting and neglect of the team cost them success in nearly every conceivable way. They didn't pay attention to what Don Waddell was doing. They just gave him rudimentary directions on what to do and he went full speed ahead with it. His hands were tied in a lot of ways, and it showed in the awful product they were putting out on the ice. But consider this. The Winnipeg Jets didn't experience playoff success either until 2018, mostly due to the poor actions of the Thrashers and Atlanta spirit. Now imagine if that 2018 run had happened in Atlanta. Maybe the Thrashers get enough of a support base to stay put in the South. It worked for the Hurricanes and Predators. Winning cures a lot of ills, but it just didn't happen here. I used to think it was just because Atlanta was a bad hockey market. They were more into Georgia football and Braves baseball. It wasn't a four-sport city. But looking back on it now, this wasn't the fault of the fans or the city. It was the Thrashers themselves. Blue Land never had a damn chance. Not with the shitty ownership or the shitty management they had. Few teams can survive like that, especially in a market where hockey isn't a staple. My question is what would have happened if they had legitimately competent ownership? Look at Tampa Bay. Around the time the Thrashers were on the brink of moving, the Lightning were a fucking mess. The Oren Kulis and Len Berry partnership had them as a punchline. Bad teams, massive financial issues, attendance plummeted, fan favorites traded left and right. But once they were finally free from them and purchased by an owner that cared, things turned around. It took a few years, but the results were obvious. If you think about it, that could have been Atlanta. But that's merely a what-if scenario. What's done is unfortunately done. So if you're a hockey fan in Atlanta still watching this, I'll pour a cold one out for you. All this time I thought all this was due to fan apathy. But now I see there were some legitimate reasons for it. You can share some beers with Coyotes fans if they move in the near future. I think they too may know a thing or two about shitty ownership. Tampa Bay looking to create something here and get themselves back into this hockey game. They're only down by a couple. Bobby Armstrong laboring. The net is up for uh, Johan Hedberg. What? Is that why they call him a net minder? I Nobody know. stopped play. You gotta stop play. Uh, nobody sees that? <laughs> wow.